Alright, after all the development we just got, we're back to standard 11 minute romps. What are we starting with this time? Magic is real here. What is that? So before I get to talking about anything else, you may be asking what the hell this incredibly trippy art style is all about. Well, this episode, titled Sea Bunnies, was written, directed, composed, and even animated by one Julian Glander. It scares me. While it may be off-putting at first, you then remember it wasn't unheard of for Adventure Time to do guest animators in select episodes. And Julian not only did a little segment for Gumball before this, but he even did a few title cards for this series. So in that regard, it's a pretty endearing move. Please don't slurp, please don't slurp. Hey, yo! And while this isn't exactly a style I'd want to see for a full series, it does have its own charm, and he did a solid job translating these sorts of designs over to 3D. I know that facial expression. You're hungry. Here, have a sea cucumber. That said, yeah, it's an unmistakable giveaway of how much DNA this show shares with AT, which is something this season makes obvious even beyond this example. The more it evolves, the more it chooses to go really experimental and out there with its episodes. And like that other show, the results are kind of mixed. Case in point, the very next episode decides to combine Oscar and Alice, which proves to be quite the unexpected fun dynamic. Let's say we get out of here. Dancing banana Sundays on me. Yep, I'm comfortable letting my guard down. The actual episode is pretty typical involving this mushroom gossip, but the novelty really helps it stand out. There's also a nice little flashback story where a younger hedgehog and Oscar join his dad on the camping trip, where the poor elephant kid is constantly treated like a sack of potatoes. The middleman in the boat who must stay in his place lest he risk putting everything off balance, which in typical Oscar fashion he does. Nothing is happening. <laughs> so upon settling for the night, the kids are restless in fear over this fabled spirit known as the Jersey Devil. Which, by the way, is indeed a part of real New Jersey folklore. Isn't that a fascinating base to drive a Coach Network story around? And these fears only seem to get confirmed when some sandwiches they leave mysteriously disappear in the night. Did you guys eat our sandwiches to make it look like the Jersey Devil was here? I should mention too that this episode is framed around wanting to preserve some Pine Barrens so the witches don't tear it up into a spot for themselves. A bit random, but definitely in character. And it does give us another smart hedgehog moment, so it's all good. Probably my favorite, however, is one where the library door is broken, meaning everyone has to keep quiet until it's fixed. And unfortunately, that can only happen when Oscar retrieves a key ingredient across a bridge where a scary monster seems to be lurking. Uh -huh. All this is accompanied with almost no background music, leaving only the natural sounds of the forest serving as the audio track. And anyone who knows me well enough knows that I eat this aesthetic heavy stuff up like nobody's business. No joke, when I first watched this, I really turned up the surround speakers because it is just that beautiful and immersive to me. But they aren't all winners. There's a flashback to Witch School focusing on Mallory and Emma, which sounds interesting on the surface and we do get some neat lore out of it. But only hearing this alligator's voice for several minutes honestly grated on me fast. <sighs> so do you know? We're looking for? I'm happy to lead. Okay, I'm just spit. Shut up! And then there's the episode centered on the bond between a snowflake and his high heel wearing mouse. And I'm sorry, why does this character look distractingly like Arthur? How am I supposed to take that design seriously? But with all this being said, what may seem like another string of random assorted stories actually has more consistency than you may think. Because each and every one of these 13 episodes center around the general topic of fear. Some more overtly and spotlighted than others, but it's always there in some capacity. The first one is about fear of the unknown, the next one has Alice fearing the mushroom death cap, twice do superstitions come up, two, once with the classic phrase breaking the leg where Oscar wants to live his dream of successfully preparing and serving breakfast while the monsters are out on the skiing trip, 
and again where Oscar appears to pass his bad luck to Hedgehog. Pine cones hit the average person on the head three times a year. In fact, come to think of it, a lot of the plots this season go to Oscar, which makes sense as, like I've said before, he's home to a lot of the personal stories. And as the introvert who has to come out of his shell over the course of his time at camp, yeah, that checks out even more perfectly. I've already mentioned his bridge monster, the bad luck superstition, and the Jersey Devil, but there's also situations like him screwing up ghost store manners thanks to his own anxiety and their rule going against his ever polite habits. Then you must improve your manners. Only then will I put your knuckle sandwich back in the fridge. Dude, we're eight. And also him finding this buried root outside Susie's yard that he raises like a child, which is weirdly a recurring thing for him in the show, by the way. And he becomes afraid to stand up to the root, even when they're draining the energy of all his campmates. My bottom is cold, but my top is hot. Okay, maybe this one isn't all that grounded, but it still ties back to a relatable social problem. Oscar! One step closer, and I drain him dry. But rest assured, there's still a few of these that go to other characters. One of Hedgehog's has her becoming paranoid about potential bad futures seemingly caused by the most innocuous of ripple effects. Wow. Is he chewing gum in school? Oh my gosh. High school Oscar is a... a ne'er-do-well. This is a pretty common type of story for any setting that has magic in it. In fact, the show kind of dabbled in that idea before, and the other show I did a big review on does exactly that as well. And much like the Dead End example, I like that they gave Hedgehog a mature moral here. When I get stressed about the future, I come down here. So I didn't mess anything up? Not the future, at least. Maybe mess yourself up worrying so much over it. It is kind of weakened by the realization that the Pharaoh's seeds he uses only list hypotheticals. But all the same, the idea does stick in one's head after. Have a seat. I call the coroner! <sighs> Another equally deep story of hers is when she needs to be paired with her broom and must explore her family tree to figure out where her witch genes came from. Do you want to know how I lost me eye? So not only does she meet all her grandmas, but it also turns into a good old generational trauma story. Why do you sit like that? If I fly sitting up, everyone will see me and I'll be a sitting duck for witch hunters. But really, she doesn't get all that much else this season. With a few exceptions, she's mainly bouncing off Oscar. Which I mean, yeah, there's a core part of her character and their interactions sign just as much as ever. But it also kind of illustrates how front-loaded most of her development actually is. Which may not bother you on first viewing, but it does become noticeable when you think about the show as much as I have. But the most atmospheric, memorable episode of the whole season, and might I remind you this season gave us freaking sea bunnies, is the one they chose to end on. And of all characters, it stars Pepper. Traversing through a thick fog only to get lost in the thick spooky woods, encountering bizarre characters as he tries to find his way to Susie's place. I've mentioned before how the general style of the show is like a children's storybook, and no episode brings that vision to life any more effectively than this one. The general structure, the sense of imagination, the types of creatures we see, even the sound design really takes you into the journey, very akin to Over the Garden Wall now that I think about it. Also, Keith David's in this. Can you see Susie's house? I can see her chimney. <laughs> so yeah, season 4 probably is the single best illustration of just what Summer Camp Island has evolved to. Where what may seem like some levity after all the world building and character development contains just as many layers of depth and thought provoking themes as ever. All while still being a light hearted entertaining cartoon at the end of the day. While there are a few episodes that feel like the type of Adventure Time joint I'd skip, I'd say SCI has generally had a better idea on where its deeper messages and stories should be placed, without heavily intruding on the main cast and appeal that attracted its audience in the first place. But with all that said, this is the last season to have fully standalone episodes, as the storytelling of this show is soon gonna kick straight into high gear.